Alan Sandri from the Department of External Relations at the Indian School of Business and also an ISB alumnus from the founding class of Management Program in Public Policy. Indian School of Business, Mariu, Bharata Videshanga Shaka, Samyuktanga Nirvahistuna, Rectan Dialogue, Conference of Economic Diplomacy ki, Development, ki, Hajara in a Prithri Dhanandar Ki, Swagatam Su Swagatam. <laughs> Thank you so much. After a very grand inaugural ceremony, by the tone and tenor of the conference has been set by the ministers and the dignitaries present in the inaugural ceremony, we now move to the dialogue one, the very first dialogue, taking economic diplomacy to grassroots for strengthening development partnership. In this panel, we will have Professor Rajendra Srivastava, Dean, ISB, Vinod K. Jagat, Joint Secretary, Economic Diplomacy and States Division, Ministry of External Affairs, Ambassador T. P. Srinivasan, former permanent representative of India to the United Nations, Ms. Jennifer Dogney, Consul General, Consulate General of Canada and South India, Sri J. Krishna Kishore, CEO, Andhra Pradesh Economic Development Board, and Mr. S. Shukumar, Head Agri and IT Business IT Limited. Can I request Dean Srivastava to start the session? In the interest of, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. In the interest of time and logistics, I will just uh, speak from the chairs. And uh, now each of us will take about uh, five to seven minutes, but uh, since I'm the moderator for the session, I'll cheat a little bit and take maybe eight to ten minutes to set up the stage. So we've had a very interesting uh, morning session and uh, a couple of, I mean, a bunch of good ideas were thrown in, uh, but uh, let me just put, uh, you know, one from each of the morning speakers. Uh, uh, Minister KTR talked about the United States of India. The logic being there's no one India, there's a lot of diversity in India. So when we're talking about uh, trade and business and trade, uh, then the opportunities and challenges are going to be, uh, you know, by, by geography, not just by sector. Uh, we had uh, Sridhi Raju uh, put forth many ideas, but I think one of the key ideas was that uh, we need to look at the tariff system, not only for imports, but also to encourage exports. And uh, sometimes it was easier to manufacture goods outside of India than in India. Uh, General Singh talked about a lot of things, but I will uh, mention only one, and uh, this doesn't overlap. Uh, and that is looking at uh, the sort of a global labor movement, if you will. So while we have uh, we've examined the impact of uh, the IT sector, the service sector, uh, those kind of expansions are uh, further possible, perhaps in area in areas such as healthcare services. The format is going to be uh, different. But in addition to looking at the uh, services sector, he stressed the need to look at uh, manufacturing. But again, coming back to manufacturing, we're going to have to look at uh, what are the barriers and what are some of the uh, challenges and therefore opportunities. So with that as a background, uh, let me uh, take a little bit of a business uh, perspective since uh, I represent the, the School of Management. And uh, we did a quick look at uh, the export-import mixes. And if you look at global world trade, which is now about 16 to 17 trillion dollars, about 70% of that value of, the, of that trade is what I would call a big, big basket. Uh, items such as uh, uh, that would include uh, high, you know, electronics, high end engineering products, and so on. And only about 30% of international trade, close to $5 or trillion, dollars, is in what I would say things that are close to commodities. And included in those commodities would be things like automotive components and so on. So these would be unbranded you know, goods, if you will. Now, unfortunately, when we look at uh, India's exports, 70% of, of India's exports are really at the low end, at the, at the small basket. So not only do we need to grow the size of the basket, 
We also need to get into the big basket category and not just be at the lower end trading commodities, which means we need to start looking at the, the, the value added. When we look at value added, and I know that too many people have been using uh, iPhone, Apple as an example, but to give you, you know, what goes on out there is a lot of Apple products, in fact, they will say designed in California, they won't even say designed in the US. So California has its own brand value for design. So it's uh, designed in uh, California, it may be uh, prototyped, uh, you know, elsewhere, let's say in Korea. And, uh, or maybe the US, and the manufacturing is coming out of Taiwan and South Korea. And maybe the final assembly might take place perhaps in India. But the point really is so that the value added is more at the design stage, at the invention stage, and not really at the, at the final assembly stage. So with that, uh, in, the, in the business community, we talk about something called the smile curve. A uh, smile curve is so that your highest value added on the supply chain side is really coming through R&D and prototyping and those kind of activities. A somewhat lower level is attracted through the product, you know, for the core card, you know, production of core uh, components, and the last, the least value added is in assembly. So this is the supply side. The value added starts increasing when we go from production to sales, and subsequently to after sales service. So when we look at the value added, it should not just be on the manufacturing side, it should also be on the demand side. What is the role that we are playing in creating brand India, in creating the perceived value of products that are coming out of this country, and in terms of adding value to products through complementary services. So, if we are looking at, uh, let's say, even at uh, the Indian market, Maruti is the strongest company right now with about a 49% market share. They managed to hang on to it, not because the competitors are not coming in with good designs, but they have the most, ex most extensive you know, repair and, uh, and service network to support the cars in India. So we need to, on a global level, similarly, we need to look at that, uh, that balance. So what I would like to say is not only should we be looking at make in India, we should be looking at design in India, and we should be looking in marketing not only within India, but also marketing globally. So you know that's, that should be part of our agenda in, in trade and business. The second thing that uh, we have noticed is when we look at Western companies, the value added comes in terms of designing new products, features, let's say. So with new technology coming and new capability added to a product, they tend to price it high, then a year later the prices get knocked down, so they come down the value curve with innovation driving the value in the very technical. When I look at companies from the East, whether they're Japan, from Korea, from Taiwan, we have from the East, we've typically started at the bottom, and then we have started climbing up the ladder, you know, through services and through branding and so on. And I think uh, in order to execute the, lat the latter strategy, what we actually need is something called the regional value chain. So it is not just India. It's going to be what can India do in collaboration with Sri Lanka and, and Bangladesh, etc., uh, that we need to be looking at the regional value chains. Uh, there are many uh, policies that are in place. Of, of course, uh, you know, make in India, skill India, uh, smart cities, uh, you know, we at ISP have a infrastructure, the Pulse Lloyd Infrastructure Institute in Mali uh, that is focusing on, on smart cities, and so is the Srini Raju uh, Center for Information Technology in the Hyderabad campus. You know, we're looking at, from both campuses, we're looking at smart cities issues. So these are some of the initiatives that are already in play. The biggest uh, movement, I think, uh, that can uh, engage all of us and integrate all our skills and capabilities is really digital India. And the Aadhaar card has provided a big movement in that direction. What we're doing with the India stack actually could be involved in government to government kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, trade, if you will, across the world. We're doing some incredible work out there. Um, we, uh, 
general saying, uh, no data that we've gone up in uh, the ease of doing business and the ease of doing business will be distributed across the states. And uh, KTR, uh, Minister KTR noted that if uh, Telangana was to be ranked by itself, it would be ranked much higher than the number 100 ranking that India has. So while it's been incredible to come up from 130 to 100, we still have a long way to go. But uh, I think what General Singh was talking about is, uh, is very important, that uh, foreign collaborators need to understand where in India they would find the kind, right kind of resources, whether they're the people resources or the markets and so on. And so the, that, that notion of ease of doing business across India is critical. In order to do all of this, we have to foster innovation. And that, of course, that innovative spirit is very much there in our youngsters as I run across them. And uh, so Brand India should be forward-looking, in my opinion, not just backward-looking. So with that, uh, there are some areas where we're moving incredibly fast. We're moving from 3G to 5G. We're moving from PC to mobile, much faster than some of the Western nations. And um, we are also make, making rapid strides in areas such as healthcare. I think it is uh, time to ride some of these waves uh, and uh, look at uh, not only diplomatic uh, uh, efforts that we made, we should actually look at uh, our hard diplomacy and see how we can uh, you know, help uh, countries in Africa and Southeast Asia and the less, uh, lesser developed countries you know, climb, up the, uh, climb up the development curve. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work to be done, and I think in doing this work, uh, there are several things that are needed. Number one, as a nation, we need to become more flexible. We are sometimes tied with doing things the way we did them last year, and uh, very often I hear the term, essay to hota hai. Okay, so we need to get away from essay to hota hai to figure out how to do things uh, in the new future. Uh, that we face. So we need, uh, we need to become a land of flexibility, a land of information, and uh, we uh, need to take advantage of the fact that uh, there's a, the center, economic center of gravity is drifting east. It's drifting east, in my opinion, not because of just the technology. It's drifting east because of the markets. China has gone through its wave, and I think the next wave is India in terms of the available markets. And that is the reason why many, many companies are interested. And India is not just an Indian market. If we just look at the newspapers and what has been happening in the last month, the last week, what we find is uh, Walmart has become a major partner for, the, for the Flipkart. If we look at Amazon, Amazon derives its profits in, let's say, retailing, takes them to Amazon Web Services, and then takes the profits from AWS and brings them to Amazon Prime. So, you know, we see a new competitor in the entertainment space in India, a company called Amazon. And uh, if we look at uh, in the finance and in the banking sector, sector, Paytm is heavily financed actually by Alipay from China. So India is actually, the Indian market is actually a global market. And we just cannot think of it anymore as, a, as an Indian market. So with that, uh, um, let me just uh, conclude by making one final comment about ISP. And uh, somebody noted earlier on that uh, ISP is very innovative. And the reason why we are innovative is that we are precocious, we're young, we don't follow rules. And this particular conference, uh, Guru noted, he came to me and uh, I okayed it within, within minutes. And at ISP, we have a rule, if you have a good idea, it will be recognized immediately and then you become responsible for it. <laughs> so, so with that, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, you know, call on, uh, on um, let's see, uh, I'll, I'll just go by the order that we had out here. It's the, uh, we know the Jacobs from IFS, and uh, you could have your uh, Thank you, Dean. Um, first, let me begin by expressing appreciation to the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad for the manner in which they have worked with us, the Ministry of Digital Affairs, in conceptualizing and organizing the digital dialogue. Um, the respected Minister of State for Digital Affairs has already laid out his thinking 
He's challenged us to come up with some uh, articulations and discussions on specific areas. And uh, uh, other speakers have also identified the various trends that we see in, in respect of economic diplomacy. Uh, these are both important topical as well as emerging trends. How we deal with it and uh, deal with it together is the challenge. Um, I would also, before I come to the five points that I have with me uh, in my presentation, uh, like to acknowledge the excellent profile of the audience on a Sunday. Uh, we have the students from the ISB and the other institutions, I'm told, nearby institutions. We have uh, uh, acclaimed academicians, uh, industry leaders, uh, we have intellectuals, members of the fourth estate, the media, uh, officials of the state governments, and uh, also from the center, and friends from the foreign embassies, I have one of them sitting to my left, and the consulates. So, before, so let me now come to the five observations I have. First, economic diplomacy has manifested itself in multiple ways since the Westphalian system of state sovereignty. And globalization has particular relevance for us. Uh, when I say us, it includes the basket of developing countries, uh, emerging economies. Uh, including India, China, Japan, ROK, uh, some of the Southeast Asian countries, <coughs> Africa, Latin America, and Caribbean. The principal thing that we have to keep in mind is that this system has benefited us. At the same time, we have suffered from some of the aberrations of the system, and we have also learned to adapt to the system as it has evolved. And therefore, it is absolutely natural for a country like India, an emerging economy like India, to expect that the, the art, uh, governance architecture of the international economic system, uh, of the international economic system, is reformed on a regular basis to reflect structural realities. The second observation I have to make is that uh, the government of India and I believe the entire governing uh, system in India, that includes state governments and the governments of union territories, we take a holistic approach to the evolution of the international economic system. And that deals with the transnational flows of uh, goods, capital, technology, aid, assistance, multinational companies, and development partnership. You cannot say that, you know, at this point of time, this is how it is. And this is this is how I'm going to handle it, and I'm going, not going to change because the world around us is changing. So we've taken a holistic approach. We have also taken a dynamic approach. Our domestic policies, of course, as you would expect any self-respecting uh, uh, state to do, domestic policies are aimed at fo focusing development aspirations. And while we uh, promote these development aspirations, try to uh, attain these aspirations, we are also in sync with the international system. And this is an important element at this point of time, the current uh, international economic uh, scenario, because after decades when most of the developing world, including Asia and Africa, have come to feel a sense of comfort with the way the international uh, multilateral trading system is evolved, centered around the WTO, we see there is a certain degree of rethink in certain Western economies. Now, how we navigate these, the, the issues associated with this change is going to be one of the important tasks of economic diplomacy. <coughs> we should also, while doing so, be conscious of the fact that economic diplomacy has evolved in, uh, in multiple ways, and the challenge of that is as to deal with uh, encompass a large number of subjects for which we do not, uh, in which uh, it, it throws up issues for which we do not have immediate responses. They include artificial intelligence, big data, it's already been mentioned, internet of things, e-commerce, emphasis on renewable energy, smart cities, urban management and the like. Government of India's various programs like Digital India, Make in India, Startup in India are some of the responses that we have attempted and we continue continually uh, fine-tune that. The third observation that I have is about cooperative federalism. And we, uh, the Honorable Minister of State has already mentioned, it uh, touched, about it, touched upon it on the, both the cooperative side as well as the competitive side. It is 
our firm conviction that this involves and requires greater coordination between the center and the states of the union territories. And the most practical manifestation of this is in the economic and commercial side. The uh, Honorable Minister from uh, uh, the government of Telangana also referred to it on uh, multiple occasions. And what is heartening for me as a head of the Economic Diplomacy and States Division is that we see that friendly foreign governments, either the consulates here or the embassies in Delhi, are able to understand and appreciate this more and more. They're better informed. And therefore, we see there is a huge sense of huge uh, opportunity or set of opportunities opening up for us. The fourth uh, the point that I would like to make is um, the Dean mentioned about Africa. The Dean mentioned about Aadhaar diplomacy. I don't want to touch directly upon that. But the point about development partnership is significant because it has always been an article of faith for the government of India, because this is the basis on which we carry out most of our cooperation with developing countries. And it has within it a set of principles which are based on consent, the requirements of the recipient country, and the willingness to work together without conditionalities. As India becomes an economic success story, we become economically more uh, comfortable, therefore the we have the resources then to uh, uh, enhance other elements of our national power. I am reasonably confident that we will continue with the, uh, the approach we have taken to de development partnership, which is that we should not have, as a result of a cooperation, any, we should not impose, as a result of a cooperation, any set of uh, behaviors expected out of recipient countries, which have a restrictive impact on their freedom elsewhere in the international economic system. Because that is a big challenge for many countries in Africa and uh, some parts of Latin America. And these are our natural friends and uh, partners. The final point that I would like to make is that economic diplomacy and development partnership are not the exclusive domain of the government, whether be it uh, the central government or the state governments, etc. Its success depends on multiple stakeholders. We have to go beyond the confines of governments at different levels in India. And there's a, there's, there's a limit to what Delhi can do. The success of our economic diplomacy and our engagement with the states essentially depends on how we are able to pool our respective strengths together for the national good. Before I conclude, a couple of points. Um, which I like to uh, flag. I have already emphasized about the importance we attach to the international economic system, but I'd like to emphasize on the importance that we attach to international law, both public international law and private international law. The norms of international law, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, rules of international law, they guide our external uh, uh, action. Um, and. I totally endorse what uh, the Dean has mentioned as my uh, final observation. The economic center of gravity is drifting east. The challenge is how we are able to come together uh, in various formats, when, whether it is in regional format or is the, in uh, multiple formats that are evolving over a period of time, so that we gain the maximum benefit for India and its citizens. Thank you. Uh, we will, uh, we are trying to go through about five to seven minutes uh, each, so we will hold the questions to the end. So we'll open up uh, all of us for you know questions as soon as we've sort of run through our, our key points. Uh, with that, uh, may I uh, request uh, Ambassador Shrinivasan to take over? Thank you very much. Hello. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be back. ISB. Thanks to our friend uh, Kumar Guru. I was here three or four years ago, and now it looks that ISB has grown with much distance and a bit of love. Uh, let me also say how the deadline to have the minister in the audience, because normally ministers give us their wisdom and deep. They rarely stay back to hear other people's wisdom. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for joining us. 
So this is a dialogue and therefore we need to have also a dialogue between generations. And that seems to be the reason why I'm here. As against Binod, who is presently in the Foreign Service, I left the Foreign Service 14 years ago. It was a different world altogether. And that is why perhaps I was asked to speak on economic diplomacy because we knew nothing about it during our time. <laughs> we were, those were the days when politics was everything. And uh, people who did economics or trade in the embassy were put down upon and everybody wanted to do politics. This has not changed very much. But now at least from the government side the emphasis has shifted. And the reason for that is our change in our foreign policy itself. Many people ask as to what is the, <coughs> the real difference between Nehruvian foreign policy and Mr. Modi's foreign policy or present foreign policy of India. And the one thing that I always say is that the priorities have been established in the present foreign policy of India. Because Nehruvian foreign policy tended to project India's needs as the world's needs. He said at his famous speech on 15th August that India has its dreams, but these are also the dreams of the world. And therefore we promoted disarmament, for example, because we didn't have any army, so it was easy to disarm. <laughs> we talked about decolonization because we had no colonies, it was fair enough. We talk about uh, economic rights and the equitable distribution of wealth, that was fair enough. And therefore, we were speaking for the world, or at least for the developing world. There was, our focus was on politics. How democracy is important. How dialogue is important. How cultures are important. And that was the kind of frame that the Indian foreign policy had. But if you look at Mr. Modi's presentation of foreign policy in its entirety, his first priority is development, what he calls FDI first develop India. And the second is security. He does not talk about non-alignment, he does not talk about solidarity of the developing world, anything of that kind. So this is a very different kind of approach to India's needs. And what does he say to the world? He says India is a great country, an ancient country, an ancient civilization, and we have a good government, but years afterwards we have a one, one party or a major one-party coalition, and, you are, and India has a great Prime Minister. He's, he's not shy of saying that. And therefore, what he's saying is, we have things to offer to the world. And we are offering to the world what India can offer. And he expects something in return. People may say this is transactional, unlike Pandit Nehru, who was promoting the world altogether. What exactly would be better for India, we would know later. But this is what has changed the functioning of our missions abroad. Because from a perspective of global identity, we are projecting our own strengths and our own needs to the world. And therefore, I think today's diplomats can look at their functioning and even their accomplishments in terms of specificities, which was not possible during our time, when it was all very nebulous. We could not say we promoted peace in the world or we disarmed the world. But here we could say what exactly have you obtained from your contacts with the rest of the world. And here I think the Ministry of External Affairs, though it, had, it was given the role of looking after all aspects of foreign policy, in actual fact, in the past, Ministry of External Affairs was simply a coordinating ministry. Because all the so-called specialized ministries did most of our economic and trade work. And as a foreign service officer in the mission, what we did was basically follow the economic pattern of that country, bring to government of India's attention some of the possibilities that India can do, organize visits of our delegations, and the substantive work, work the embassy was rarely involved. With the setting up of the, uh, the Division of Economic Affairs, this was supposed to change. But it did not change even at that time. 
So the forensic challenge today is to transform this narrow approach to the world to a more, more practical, if you say, if you like, transactional approach to India's world policy. And that is why economic diplomacy has become very important. What, is, what has been our contribution to economic diplomacy in the old world? That was basically in the multilateral sphere, I would say, having spent 20 years at the United Nations. I can say that our contribution to trade, commerce, and later environment, and even later nuclear energy, all these have been in the multilateral sector. There we had certain advantages because we were the leaders of the developing world as it were. Whether it was the non-aligned movement or the relative G77, we could in a sense hide behind these great groups which projected the requirements of the developing world and our role was basically to shape that policy or shape that approach into which we injected Indian interests. So we were able to do much in this context because many things have happened. If you go back to 1992, the Rio conference, the Indian delegation literally wrote the climate convention, which of course now it has been eroded. We have come very long, very far away from that situation. But the kind of things that we accomplished in Rio de Janeiro was most remarkable. If that is not economic diplomacy, what else is it? When the whole world was saying that we should reduce greenhouse gas emissions, India made it sure that the developing countries had a right to increase emissions, not to just decrease them or to regulate them. And so that kind of contribution that I made, that we have made, and also in the, in the nuclear field. Nuclear energy was virtually legitimized by the efforts of countries like India, even at a time when we were not supposed to be in the nuclear mainstream. So, talking about the previous generation of Indian diplomats, I think our opportunities to deal with specific needs of India were few. But we managed to contribute to the thinking on these issues by projecting our requirements. But today we are in a different ballgame altogether. Prime Minister did not even go to the NAM summit because he is identifying himself not with the majority of the developing nations of the world, but he is looking in terms of what he can get specifically for his priorities like development and security. People talk a lot about, joke about Prime Minister's travels, for example. But if you look at it carefully, you will find that he has not been to anywhere where his four priorities were not met. I also include not only security, but the Indian diaspora and the neighborhood. So, and therefore the responsibility of Indian diplomacy today is to identify in each country that you're working with and try to see what you can obtain by offering what we have. And this is what the exercise that we found. What are our requirements? I think first and foremost is energy, secure, securing energy for India. The nuclear power has suffered on account of Fukushima and the various other developments that have taken place since our nuclear team. So we are naturally shifting away from nuclear power, though we do not admit it, of course, to more renewable energy, solar elements, and things like that. And therefore, we are, the focus was on not nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. But now it is not that. It is now how much energy that you can generate and you can make it secure for you. And that is why we have a much better relationship to the Gulf. At one time we thought that the religion would be a factor, it would inhibit us. But you have seen that it has not inhibited us. So now we are going to have oil storage in Mangalore. We are going to get uh, oil excavation rights in uh, Gulf countries. So the remarkable progress that we have made through diplomacy, I presume, at the highest level, down to the lowest levels of the foreign service, 
is focused on nuclear energy in a big way. Secondly, again talking about the car, we need to have mobility of workers, which is a very essential thing. I live in Kerala, and Kerala is today what it is simply because of the young people who went to the car. Otherwise, Kerala would have submerged in the Arabian Sea long ago. Now we are submerged in Arabian money. <laughs> so, so, how do we ensure that? That is economic diplomacy, as you call it, if you, if you ask me. We need to have a relationship with the Gulf countries, different from what we had before. The employer-employee relationship. And that is what I think the Prime Minister is trying to change now. They need to have a stake in India's future. The Gulf countries, and we are seeing that. We are seeing it in Saudi Arabia, we are seeing it in UAE, we are seeing it in Bahrain. So, economic diplomacy has succeeded in ensuring that the mobility of workers, in spite of the fact that and others, that everybody wants to uh, nationalize workers, etc. But if you take specific interest in what they need and project our requirements, it might be possible for us to maintain the continuity in our labor uh, mobility. Third, of course, is physical connectivity. It's already spoken of. And here our biggest threat or danger is from the BRI, China's BR initiative, Bridge Road initiative. This is a much bigger threat than what we can imagine. Because we can keep out of it as long as we want, but imagine yourself standing in the middle of the traffic like a traffic policeman and watching all these people moving around you without any benefit for you. He has only polluted the policeman's air. What does the policeman get by standing there with all these roads and people passing through? And that situation will come if, I'm not suggesting that we join the initiative, if we do not do things or aggressive economic diplomacy to create an alternate, create an alternative for BRI. Of course, we do not have the resources, we do not have the initiative, we do not have that kind of attraction from other countries, but we ought to have physical connectivity, which goes beyond or at least near what the, uh, what the Chinese uh, initiative has been. Of course, data has been mentioned. Uh, somebody mentioned it is the oil, new oil. And uh, data is, of course, something on which India has a, a certain specialized knowledge. Had it not been for the Indian, San Jose would not have been what it is today. So, we need to have control over data, but that is easier said than done, because our software industry or hardware industry are all mostly fashioned on other people. And the Chinese have a big role in our uh, computer life. And therefore, I don't know how we'll be able to get hold of it, particularly after the Facebook scandals and things like that. But there again, I think, because we have the intellectual ability to handle data, the process of flowing data from developed countries into developing countries, particularly for us to further develop it and innovate it. And that might be a good point uh, for us to pursue. And lastly, access to technology. We have been denied technology for a long time on the basis of the MPT. There have been so many sanctions, etc., from the United States on us. But the nuclear deal has broken it, at least the essence of isolation of India on the basis of not signing the NPT is changed. And therefore, nuclear technology, all technology should be available to us. And there our strength is basically being able to contribute to that technology and make it better. So, I was just trying to uh, indicate the kind of agenda that we need in our economic policy. So, it's not enough that we promote our trade. Because well, there was a time when we had nothing to promote. I remember in 1970, there was this famous exhibition in Osaka where the major product that India exhibited was a white tiger. And that was what we were promoting. But I'm sure in Dubai in 2020, we will not take a white tiger. We may still take sari-clad Indian women,
but I'm sure we'll not attack, take a tiger. We'll have enough to show. So that is the, really the challenge of diplomacy today, from a white tiger diplomacy to a computer diplomacy. And is our foreign service ready for it? And that is the challenge. And these kind of discussions, these kind of dialogues, I hope, will give that thrust to our diplomacy so that we adapt it to the circumstances which are pressing and important. Thank you very much. With that, we move to a Canadian perspective. Uh, Jennifer Dodd. Very pleased to be here today, and thank you very much to the uh, Indian School of Business, as well as to the Minister of External Affairs for organizing this session. As the Dean's introduction for this panel noted, grassroots economic diplomacy is certainly becoming increasingly important. We also just heard that from the, the Ambassador um, from India, uh, former Ambassador to the United Nations. But at the same time that it's becoming increasingly important, I would say that economic diplomacy is also becoming increasingly sophisticated. Governments at all levels are being challenged to rethink their approaches to what I perceive as one of the key objectives of economic diplomacy, and that is to attract talent and investment and form lasting economic partnerships for their jurisdictions. As the representative of the Ministry of External Affairs mentioned, Various players have a key role in economic diplomacy. It's not just the country, it's also the states, and it also goes down to the city level, as well as the private sector and industry associations. So as part of the economic diplomacy process, it's critical that government authorities look closely at how they can become, their jurisdictions can become more attractive to potential investment partners both foreign investment partners and domestic investment partners. What states or cities offer in order to be competitive varies considerably, but it can involve world-class incubators and accelerators. We have one here in, in Hyderabad, T-Hub, certainly ranks uh, right up there with, with top incubators. Uh, we have global partners, uh, global counterparts in Canada. I'll mention one in Waterloo, Ontario called Communitech, or an organization called Wavefront in Vancouver. It also can include tax, tax credit programs to support research and development, support for employee skills programs, and sometimes tax breaks for companies undertaking significant investments. Not only do states, cities, and countries need to have a good offer to attract investment and innovation partners, but they also need to ensure that they tell their story well through place branding and marketing. Some of the, the uh, introductory material for this, the Deccan Dialogue talks about healthy competition among federal states. I agree that such competition can often be positive in terms of pushing states and cities to refine their offer and better market their jurisdiction. I think if we look at Telangana and uh, the way uh, tel both Telangana and Andhra Pradesh have really strived to, uh, to ensure that they rank well in the ease of doing business. Those are, of course, critical indicators that serve to, uh, to increase the attractiveness of a jurisdiction. But there can also be times when such a competition can have a sharp edge, and at times it can even reduce the overall benefit of an investment initiative. So it's important to keep that in mind uh, as you look at the, the whole competitive aspect of foreign direct investment attraction. I would note it can also be difficult for subnational entities to effectively market themselves abroad. For example, if you take a state such as Telangana, or even a city such as Hyderabad, how do they successfully position themselves in a world where both entities may be relatively unknown to many business people? So in, both in terms of ensuring that competition is healthy and helping uh, subnational entities to position themselves, there can be important benefits when cities and states take a cooperative and collaborative approach rather than engaging strictly as competitors. So this is where we get to the Canadian, uh, the Canadian story. 
And I'm going to outline briefly several recent aspects of the Canadian experience with respect to our efforts to attract foreign direct investment and whether there might be some useful lessons to India. Just a quick word of context. Foreign investment plays a very key role in Canada's economy. Investment from foreign-controlled multinational uh, enterprises totals approximately $800 billion and provides employment for 1.9 million Canadians. That's a figure that represents one in eight jobs in Canada. Obviously, our population is much, much smaller than what you, uh, you have in India. Not surprisingly, Canada's foreign ministry, Global Affairs Canada, has a very strong mandate and capacity with respect to economic diplomacy. I would note in response to the ambassador's comments that we were perhaps an early convert to economic diplomacy. Our trade and economic personnel were fully integrated into the foreign ministry more than 30 years ago. If you look at foreign direct investment, ultimately it takes place locally. It takes place in a city or municipality. Therefore, as I hinted earlier, it's not unusual to encounter large cities in the same country battling it out for investment dollars on foreign turf. Until relatively recently, this was also the case in Canada. But in 2012, 11 of the largest cities in Canada opted to join forces in a grouping called the Consider Canada City Alliance, CCCA, or in French, Canada en tête. This grouping has now expanded somewhat to 13 cities or regional areas. So what we have here is a group in which the members, each of the city members, have the ultimate objective of attracting investment, talent, and partnerships to their specific jurisdiction. However, they've taken a decision to collaborate amongst each other in a very strong partnership. This is based on the recognition that it can be difficult for a single voice to make itself heard above the noise and competition in key markets abroad. As well, it's very rare that a city would have the same name recognition as a country does. And just to see if you're actually uh, following, I want to do it just a very quick, put your hands up. How many of you in the audience have heard of Calgary? Okay, not bad. Uh, how many have heard of London, Ontario? Okay, uh, Waterloo, pretty good. So I would say that there's a Waterloo-based company, OpenTex, that has a pretty big presence here in, uh, in Telangana. And the last one, Hamilton. Okay, so really what I'm trying to show is that even the big cities in Canada are, have limited name recognition on a global scale. This is also a, a bit of a more sophisticated audience that you would find than you would find in many uh, in many areas. Uh, and so if you compare Canadian cities to cities such as Mumbai, Chongqing in Canada, you've got situations where those cities, uh, some of the bigger mega cities globally, really have populations comparable to all of Canada. So what this meant in the Canadian context is our cities realized that before they can begin to market themselves effectively globally to, to potential foreign partners, they first needed to collaborate in helping to sell partners and investors on Canada. In other words, the most effective way for cities to succeed in attracting investment on a global scale is to start by collectively selling their country, to sell their country as an investment destination. And to do this in Canada, the cities work in collaboration with the federal government, which includes Canada's diplomatic missions abroad, and with our provinces. The members of the Consider Canada City Alliance also recognized that in many cases, in fact, I would argue even in most cases, they are not actually direct competitors for foreign investment and partnerships. For example, the Energy Hub of Calgary has very different strengths than the IT Center of Waterloo, Ontario. So under the collaborative partnership model that they have ad uh, adopted, it's not unusual for Canadian cities to refer a potential investor to another city for whom that investor may be a better fit. There are times when one city will represent another uh, on an investment mission abroad. 
In short, a partnership in which the members really do work together in the overall interests of the country. As a foreign ministry, Global Affairs Canada has strongly welcomed the collaborative approach taken by the major Canadian cities. We see this as a very positive contribution to more effective promotion of Canada as an investment and innovation hub and welcome the opportunity to work with a strong alliance of city partners rather than with 13 smaller entities. The collaborative approach of the cities also means they have been able to more effectively leverage organizational funding through a global affairs program called Invest Canada Community Initiatives. This ICCI program provides funding as well to individual cities for some of their research and communications activities and to facilitate participation in investment attraction missions and events in key target markets. To further improve collaboration, the Foreign Ministry Global Affairs Canada has actually placed one of our own employees into the CCCA organization. And this helps us to better understand each city member's unique advantages with regard to FDI opportunities and ensures that the city and regional members have a direct link to the Foreign Ministry and to the overseas networks of the Foreign Ministry. In addition, Global Affairs Canada works closely with CCCA to organize at least two major investment attraction missions each year, which target key investment attraction markets, uh, including Europe, the US, China, Japan, etc. My comments have largely focused on city efforts to attract investment and the support which the federal level provides to these efforts. I've taken this focus predominantly because I think that the CCCA Alliance is quite a unique organization. But clearly in Canada, we have very strong uh, state or provincial uh, uh, representatives or provincial entities. And in this regard, certainly the larger ones, I mentioned Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, and British Columbia, are also very active in foreign investment direction efforts. So as part of our efforts to ensure better alignment across all levels of government to attract and increase foreign affairs, as well as to better mobilize the private sector in this endeavor, Canada has also just launched an Invest in Canada hub. And when I say just launched, this was about six weeks ago that our Minister of International Trade uh, launched an organization which is really dedicated entirely to attracting global investment. It's a hub which looks to further refine how Canada approaches investment attraction by providing seamless one-window service, by enhancing Canada's market efforts abroad, and by further streamlining the efforts of the cities, provinces, and the private sector. At this point, I'll just say a very quick word on the private sector role. I think we're going to hear about it uh, more shortly. Uh, but without going into great detail, I will say that industry associations and companies are really very important as part of FDI attraction efforts. Uh, from the Canadian side, we ensure that they are uh, working closely with us. We call on them to provide testimonials, uh, to serve as investment champions. If you're doing an investment attraction event, I would say that it's much more powerful to hear another company speak if you're a company representative than necessarily to hear, uh, to hear a government representative speak. Uh, we also call on the private sector to provide direct advice to potential new uh, investors, given that they've, they've gone through the, uh, the whole investment process before. Just as a final word, I would say as the world becomes steadily more global, perhaps it's counterintuitive, but there's no question that grassroots economic diplomacy has become increasingly important for most countries. Uh, moreover, as these players engage in one of these elements of economic diplomacy, specifically foreign direct investment attraction, countries overall will benefit from a coordinated and collaborative effort among all players in terms of their approach to investment attraction as well as other economic diplomacy efforts. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Just, uh, we, we only have uh, uh, 
you know, two more panelists left. If, if we can leave a few minutes at the end of the session for questions. Uh, with that, uh, may I request uh, uh, Mr. Christian Kishore, uh, AP Economic Development Board. Uh, respected uh, General VK Singh, my distinguished uh, panelists, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, and also the media. At the outset, uh, I would like to say I worked as a PS uh, to four different ministers, three in the earlier NDA and one in the current NDA. I attended a number of these kind of events, but rarely I have seen a union minister sit in the audience for such a long time. This shows the importance which uh, the Honorable Minister and the Minister of External Affairs are attaching to this all-important subject of uh, economic diplomacy. I agree uh, with Ambassador Srinivasan that uh, economic diplomacy has been around since uh, independence from the time of uh, Pandit Nehru. But I would say emphatically that uh, it's our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, after 2014 he has taken economic dip diplomacy to a much greater level. He has toured nations across the world and ensured that the voice of India is heard, the opportunities in India are heard, and he has welcomed audience across the world, particularly the business audience, to come and invest in India and make use of opportunities in India as an equal partner. We went as an equal partner and not as a seeker. That is a major difference we find in the present regime. And uh, back home in Andhra Pradesh, our uh, Chief Minister, Mr. Nara Chandra Naidu, has also been a great advocate of uh, economic diplomacy. Earlier in his tenure as the Chief Minister of Combined State of uh, Andhra Pradesh, he toured a number of countries. And even in the present tenure, he has uh, uh, so far done 19 different tours across the world, inviting investments. Ambassador Srinivasan uh, very rightly said that uh, one should really look at the benefits what all these foreign tours begin. Uh, you know, beget to the nation. In fact, uh, back I can talk about Andhra Pradesh in particular because most of the tours are organized by us in the Andhra Pradesh Economic Development Board, most of uh, foreign tours of the Chief Minister, including to the World Economic Forum. All that we spent is about 30 crores on the entire delegation. But we got, I'm not talking of the committed investments, investments which are being grounded, where they have taken land, where they, some of them have started production, is close to the tune of 70,000 crores. Very Same thing is true when it comes to Honorable Prime Minister. The returns which are coming to the country are immeasurable. Today, there's so much focus on the world. It is because of the tours he's undertaking across to the world and convincing the people about India. So this is real economic diplomacy. We should take a much broader outlook. We should never see it as a foreign tour. We should see it as a great opportunity coming to the nation by these visits. And the reality is that uh, today India has now come within 100 in the ease of doing business and very soon it will further, rankings will further improve and investments are flowing across the sectors all over India. Apart from this, uh, back in Andhra Pradesh, we have embarked on a very strong policy of uh, having foreign direct investments, foreign technologies in the development of a state. For example, in the Amaravati New Greenfield Capital City, we had Singapore develop our master uh, plan for this uh, entire city. We had uh, Norman and Fosters from uh, London develop the master plan for the government city. We have companies from China who are very good in uh, bridges and landscaping doing that particular work in the city. We have some companies from Amsterdam, which is uh, which are excellent for their water technologies and water management, and canal tourism, who are now working on water management in uh, Amravati and also in development of canal tourism in the city. And Japan, which is very famous for uh, uh, you know traffic management. Tokyo is one city with uh, three crore people without traffic jams. And they are the people who are doing the traffic management uh, in uh, Amravati. Now, it's not to say that Indians are not uh, big players. Indians are very big time players. They are working hand in hand with some of the best uh, players across the world. 
The emphasis is that it's time we look globally and get the best technologies, the best people across the world to come and develop uh, our country. A very important point has been made by uh, Professor Srivastava when he talked about designs. In fact, if you see, uh, I you know I worked uh, as PS minister in the earlier India regime. I always felt bad that we had a fantastic opportunity that time to take India to the global stage. But for some reason, we had started the momentum, but somewhere we lost the race. We again got it back in 2014. I'm glad to state this time we are hands on. We are hands on on the economic race, and we are I'm, but we are bound to win this time around. But apart from the economic race as such, we have another race which we missed out last time. It is called the design race. If you see our software industry, the brains are in Silicon Valley. And who are the brains? Most of them are Indians. So the entire money, the real big money is in Silicon Valley. And the coding, the data entry operatory operation is done in India, which are the comparatively lower levels of income. So somewhere we uh, you know, lost out on the design race. And if you see countries like Singapore, countries like Switzerland, and US itself, Germany, these are all countries which have gone far ahead and won the big battle of the design race and kept the big money with them. Now this time around, we, I feel as economic, develop, uh, economic uh, uh, policy, to bring about uh, economic diplomacy policy, we must ensure that India wins the design race. In this process, back in Andhra Pradesh, we are focusing on developing Industry 4.0 technologies. We are collaborating with some of the best in the world. For example, Mr. Peter Westapaka is the founder of uh, uh, you know something called Slush, which is the world's biggest startup event, and also the co-founder of Angry Birds and a number of other initiatives. He is setting up a major robotics animation and design university in uh, Andhra Pradesh with about 50,000 students is targeting. Likewise, we have uh, tied up with UNESCO and various other organizations to bring the best design and research R&D centered digital initiatives in the state. This, I feel, is very important uh, for our country, which uh, our economic uh, you know, diplomacy should take care of. Apart from this, there are certain grey areas which uh, we need help from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. For example, today we find all over the world, we find a lot of money, big money stashed around in banks. I mean, these are legitimate money, their pension funds, etc. But there are no opportunities in those countries. Whereas there are tremendous opportunities in countries like India. So how do we attack, attack these funds to our own uh, you know, manufacturing and service sector? But we find many times the money is coming to take over companies. So if you, in the past, if you wanted to annex a kingdom and take over a, a you know, sizable net worth of 10,000 crores, you needed an army to invade and take over. But today, all that you need is to transfer the shares. Sit somewhere in Cayman Islands, Mauritius, just transfer the shares and you want 10,000 crores, same property in India without uh, making any effort. Now, this challenge is being faced in London in all over US, or you know, same problem they are grappling with. Now, how do we deal with in India? We find number of foreign you know, multinationals. We find them instead of investing in manufacturing service sector, they take over healthy industries. In, in, by the city of Hyderabad alone, number of hospitals are being taken over, number of hotels, number of industries are being taken over. I mean, not to say that it, these kind of investments are not welcome. They are welcome. But then, will Indians be left with the not so well performing companies? And so, instead, why not we direct the same investment into actual creation of jobs through new manufacturing industries? So, this is one challenge we need to look into. And uh, apart from this, <coughs> there is a very uh, important uh, point which uh, you know uh, uh, Mr. Jacob has mentioned about uh, initiative of uh, states. In uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, what we have done is we have created this Andhra Pradesh Economic Development Board based on the experience, uh, very successful experience of Singapore Economic Development Board. So we have a foreign affairs division in our uh, you know board where we have about five people working full time with on external affairs. Here we work very closely with Minister of Economic uh, External Affairs and various embassies and of uh, international embassies in India and Indian embassies abroad. 
I must say that our experience has been fantastic. Today, in Andhra Pradesh, we are actually growing about 4 lakhs and lot crores of investments in a matter of about 4 years, which no state has done. 4 lakh crores is a large amount is coming through FDA. One of the reasons is this kind of focused approach. In this, I want to acknowledge emphatically the help given by Minister XLFS. The ambassadors have been awesome. Wherever we went, whether Mr. Naudi Suri in uh, UAE or uh, Mrs. Tomer in Germany, we have seen a number of wonderful ambassadors. They have been extraordinarily helpful. I feel this kind of partnership has to continue with embassies, Indian um, uh, Minister of External Affairs, and also I would agree we need to have the business organizations also coming, like CI, FIPI, all the business entities also have to come forward. And the private initiative also has to come forward in this regard. Then, uh, a very wonderful observation was made by uh, Mrs. Jennifer regarding uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation. I fully agree. This is a very important point because we should not forget that as states we compete. Okay, today we are number one in ease of doing business. Nandhra Pradesh, so is Telangana. And we keep among the states fighting healthily for uh, you know, promoting uh, what I would say uh, investments in our respective states. But we should not forget the big picture. When we go out, we should think we are Indians. We don't belong to a state as such. So we need to have that sense of unity and create that collaborative effort so that it doesn't matter if the investment comes in our state or not. As long as it comes in some part of India, even that's good enough. So that kind of attitude <laughs> we should have. And I would go a little further because, uh, Madam, uh, in India we believe uh, in the dictum Vasudeva Kutumba, usually we believe that entire uh, you know humanity is one family. So it's not just uh, uh, you know India versus the rest of the world. We feel that we should work for win-win partnerships across the world, so that you know when it's not just India, it's even a partner country who we are trying to work with. They also should win. That is the way we have sustainable uh, collaboration models. And. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, one more point uh, which uh, Ambassador uh, <coughs> Srinivasan talked about is uh, uh, regarding uh, this, uh, you know, showcasing India in the earlier stages as, you know, White Tiger was taken probably to showcase in Japan. But I'm very happy to say that things are changing. In Andhra Pradesh, for example, we have real-time governance. We have fantastic thing which is happening nowhere in the world. We have e-governance, we have e-files. The e cabinet, no no minister sits with paper, they all with iPad. I'm not joking. And e budget, there's no paper printed for budget. And now we are going much higher level where we are putting 740 services online, completely online, so that we cut out the time. Now, we are the fantastic part of the fantastic initiative taken by Honorable Prime Minister under the Digital India. We are connecting the entire state with internet, 15 Mbps. So we have a lot of things to, uh, with just 149 rupees per month. We have a lot of things to showcase, sir, in the coming days, and I won't take much more time. But uh, <clears throat> on one, another last important point I want to state is, we are very good as a country in organizing events. But there are two things, one preceding, one following, which, which uh, I would request Minister of HL Affairs to take serious note, that is, Preparedness, research. I find like Japan, Japanese team when they come, we have handled more than 40 delegations in the last four years. A big, uh, sizable delegations, smaller delegations, more than 100. Now, I found Japanese are very serious. When they come to India, they come with 60, 70 companies, they do a lot of research, whom to meet. They ask us in advance, and which officer to meet, which company to meet. They specify, they come physically, they come meet people. They do fantastic preparation. So once they come here, you find that they are people who are actually going back with a lot of gains. So this is one thing, research, R&D we need to develop so that our own Indian businessmen gain a lot by all this uh, you know, foreign collaborations. We should see how we can strengthen our own Indian businessmen in the process. Second thing, on the event side, we are excellent. We go conduct all the events we do. India does extremely well. The third point where we have a lot of weaknesses follow. Just now, Mr. Pita Asan was talking to me, in fact, fantastic point, he made follow-up. Where do we do the follow-up? So after the event is over, do we have a system of focused follow-up so that, you know, it brings a lot of returns to the country? And uh, last but not the least, uh, 
One area I feel economic diplomacy should take into account. India being agriculture country, I think our greatest strength is agriculture, food. Uh, and this should we should not lose uh, you know uh, sight of this because all over the world we find there's a lot of demand for food. How do we increase our food exports across the world? This I feel this will help uh, our farmers in a big way if we all work seriously on this. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Our last panelist is uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar, who is the head of agriculture and IT business for ITC. Thank you, Dean, and uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, as the last speaker in the panel making opening remarks, uh, I'm very conscious of my time. Let me pick up the thread from that uh, agriculture point made uh, by Mr. Krishna Kumar, Mr. Kishore, and make three very brief points uh, and one pitch at the end. Uh, you know, when you talk about for development, I think the importance of agriculture need not be any more underscored. Because if you look at India, half of our workforce is in agriculture, not just in creating new jobs, but raising incomes of farmers becomes a very, very critical area. And a call has been made to double farmers' incomes by 2022 and uh, uh, nothing more needs to be said in terms of how important that subject is. A farmer's per capita income is just about one-fourth of the rest of us in the country today. And there are many similar farmers uh, elsewhere in the world also uh, with uh, small holdings. The second importance of agriculture comes from the angle of food security. Now it is one calculation that over the next 40 years, because of rising population, and uh, consequently rising consumption uh, supported by more incomes. In the next 40 years, we need to produce more food than what we have collectively produced over the last 8,000 years. That's the magnitude of food that we need to produce in the next 40 years. So food security of the world also depends on agriculture. So from that perspective, it's, it's a very vital area. The second brief point is, why should it be elevated to the level of diplomacy? Producing more, raising productivity, leading them to market appears a fairly business-like issue. So what is the diplomacy angle in the whole thing? <coughs> One reason is that although on the face of it, agricultural challenge of raising productivity and leading with markets is rather business-like, but that this need to be done in the context of climate change as well as depleting natural resources elevated to that level of a global challenge that one needs to grapple with the subject with the level of economic diplomacy that is uh, talked about. India is even more skewed in the context of depleting natural resources. You know, we are 17% of the world's people but only 4% of the world's water resources. Only 2.5% of the world's arable land. So obviously when you are talking about depleting natural resources, this becomes even more paramount that one needs to tackle uh, at, at a global level, whether it is from the perspective of accessing technology or collective action when it comes to climate change, doing something in one backyard is not good enough. Unless this is tackled at a global level, these problems won't get solved for a smaller farm. So from that perspective, it is one angle as to why one must elevate this to an economic diplomacy level. And another perspective in the context of a competitive federalism, because agriculture is a state subject in India. While well, call for the doubling happens from centre and many centres policies can support, but each state has to take uh, into the uh, reality. And therefore, each state depending on their own strengths, are the challenges, need to figure out where in the world is there a reciprocal dependency with someone else that can tackle my issues of technology, my issues of uh, productivity improvement and so on. And therefore, a lot of action happens at the state level uh, once we uh, look at this as an economic diplomacy issue. The third point I want to make is the importance of in some sense, a track to diplomacy. While already a fair amount of action happens 
uh, on track one in terms of the awareness policies for investments and trade, as well as much of collaboration also happens at a business level. But I think what is also important is that to translate much of this policy and convert that where I say that till it's the soil is you need to build the value chains, you need to connect them to the consumers and you may have more water, more production but unless it is linked to the market there is no way the farmers incomes can be raised, no way the food reaches consumers with minimum amount of wastage in a form that is sought and therefore the importance and criticality of ensuring the private sector participates in the dialogue and engages with the government in supplementing whatever action and therefore uh, that flag on uh, the track too. And the only pitch that I really want to make in the context of this is that as Deccan dialogue moves forward, uh, formally uh, in ISB in Hyderabad, I think I would recommend in going beyond this imperative that agriculture be an important track in this, which also brings it a special status. Thank you. We only have a few minutes left uh, to take uh, questions from the audience, so I see one hand already up. Yes, sir. First of all, I think uh, it's a bold step on behalf of uh, the Ministry of External Affairs and also ISP in having the uh, uh, Deccan Dialogue. Because the reason I say it is for those of you who, are, who have witnessed the opening ceremony, uh, clearly we had the Minister Riketi Ramaro open up about uh, the competitive states and the aspirations of states uh, for greater things. Now my question is, as uh, Jennifer rightly pointed about a collaborative approach in Canada with the CCCA uh, and Mr. Uh, Krishna Kishore also uh, demonstrating about how Andhra Pradesh is doing extremely well in terms of having a foreign affairs ministry uh, abroad. Now how do we take these initiatives forward in the current uh, uh, political scenario? Like you know, when the states are aspiring for a you know, faster uh, track in terms of expanding business, and the uh, restrictions that are, uh, you know, put in place by the Ministry of Action Affairs. How do we uh, bridge that convergence? Probably either one of you can answer that. See, first and foremost, uh, we should be very clear about one thing: anything external affairs in the country is the exclusive domain of the Ministry of External Affairs. In the process of uh, cooperative federalism, we have in states also working closely with uh, the Minister of External Affairs in the process. So I don't see any conflict here. It is but natural that because this is a deliberate design of uh, the government to have various states compete to improve the ease of doing business so that we make the entire country attractive to investors. So in the process, competition is but natural, but at the same time, we'll, I'm sure we'll keep it a healthy competition, and it will be overall under the umbrella of Minister of Islam Affairs, so we need not really worry on that. Uh, if I may add, you know, this is not something that cannot be done. In the management area, there's a term called cooperation, collaborative competition. And if you look at what we have done in India itself, you, know, you go to Europe, you go to North America, and uh, telecom companies are not making money at even 25 cents a minute charge. In India, okay, telecom companies are making money at less than one cent per minute. And one of the reasons, of course, is the large market, but the second reason is that they've actually been sharing infrastructure. So while they compete for the consumer, they actually collaborate and share the infrastructure. So there's no reason why the states and the cities cannot work together in a similar fashion through the Ministry of Uh, Other questions, uh, lady from the second one. I'd like to congratulate the ISP and the MEA for an excellent initiative. I think it's important to understand how India gives aid, and my question is directed to Mr. Jacob. Uh, one is, uh, in terms of the goodwill, India has tremendous goodwill for the amount of money given in many difficult countries, and I'm talking like countries like Afghanistan. So my question is, how do you translate this soft power gains into hard power when 
things get difficult. And secondly, you also mentioned that aid is given without any conditionalities, uh, which is a good thing because unlike other donors, uh, we give the national uh, countries to decide on their agenda. But my question here is how do we build an accountability to the kind of money India gives? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will address, I think you had a couple of questions there. The first thing about aid, as, as you know, we, we do developmental partnership, and uh, that I made it very clear in my presentation, the principles that guide the developmental partnership, and for obvious reasons, therefore, we have got the goodwill. You mentioned about, about Afghanistan. Um, uh, I, I, do, I do understand that uh, there will always be accountability issues in uh, various societies. Um, uh, we have to work with the governments there, but the big difference in the way, as far as my experience goes, I worked on the Afghan, Afghanistan desk uh, at the beginning of my career. Most recently, I was dealing with Afghanistan as well. The way we deal with these issues is to talk directly to the government in private. And that is a big difference from the way we operate compared to many other countries. There is the, the approach of name and shame with sovereign governments, with governments which are, are equal, doesn't help. Now, you mentioned about hard power and soft power. Uh, in my current responsibility, uh, I deal essentially with hard power. How aggressively am I able to market brand India? How aggressively am I able to work uh, in a collaborative fashion with all the stakeholders to promote uh, our economic interests abroad? The soft power is a secondary part of it, but I can take mention the specific example in the most recent time. Uh, after a long period of time, the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the government of Saudi Arabia, they invited India to be the guest of honor country in their premier um, cultural festival called Janatriya. And uh, uh, the External Affairs Minister decided that this is a very important opportunity in uh, mixing both the hard power component as well as the soft power component. Uh, it, you can go to the internet, you can see the YouTube, tubes, uh, uh, YouTube videos about that. Uh, the India Pavilion was based on the traditional opportunities in India and the modern opportunities in India. Uh, uh, it combined hard power and soft power. What was initially supposed to be three weeks was extended by a week. And this was on the request of the Kingdom of the Republic of uh, Kingdom of the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So I think there is something to be said for the way in which uh, we are able to uh, work with foreign governments. I don't know, maybe it is our DNA. We are more persuasive and we are more uh, able to convince our interlocutors of what we actually bring to the table, our intentions as well as, well as the benefit for, for our partners. I hope I have answered this. This is a question regarding the make in India. Uh, the manufacturing segment is not growing at the pace where it's happening in China, Korea, or Taiwan. Why are we not growing at uh, a pace which we are there growing in the manufacturing segment? And the question is directed to? Oh, <laughs> I think um, uh, I've been uh, uh, looking at this whole issue. There are many factors that are involved. Uh, one is uh, labor. And uh, this country does not encourage the quick development of large companies. There is a lot of labor sometimes outsourced because nobody wants to take the risk. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, second component is that some of the, you know, what uh, you know, Mr. Srini Raja spoke about, is that uh, sometimes there's actually an advantage to manufacturing outside of India. And so it's not just the Chinese who are bringing goods into India. You've got Indian companies who actually manufacture outside of India because it's more advantageous to, to do so. So that's the, the second thing, you know, we need to make the regulations more friendly to make an India. A third thing is that we really need to start looking at integration of the entire value chain. So 
So Mr. Shiv Kumar was just talking about it's not just about food production. It's all the way from food into market, in, in, uh, in storage and, and uh, packaging and branding. So we need to integrate the entire supply chain. And very often, we don't have you know, companies that are doing that. So, so when it uh, comes to manufacturing, it is not that we are not succeeding. We are succeeding in places. So if you look at uh, the role that Indian companies are playing, such as Bharat in the automotive supply chain, they're doing rather well. Uh, and, you know, there are other companies uh, that are doing very well in auto automotive batteries and so on and so forth. So it's not that nothing is happening, the speed is picking up slowly. But I think we need some changes in regulations to really help them out. Uh, we'll take uh, one from the back, and then I'm afraid we're already a few minutes over time. OK, so this is definitely the last question. We had a row. Um, we had a hand that's a white, white shirt. Yeah. Yes, sir, you're standing there. Can we get a speak, uh, microphone, please? Good afternoon. My name is Mal Ebenezer. I work with the Business Accelerator. Thank you so much for this excellent initiative. My question is on incubators and accelerators. I think some of you brought that up. Uh, in India, there is a need for jobs. I think we, we all know that. And we are trying to address the issue of accelerators. But in, but in the country, including the academic and the corporate accelerators, we only have around 400. Yes, the government is taking initiatives. But do we have specific initiatives to strengthen the incubators and the accelerators. Yes, I did read the NTIO report as well, but do we have more on that in terms of the government policy and in terms of the collaboration? Yes, there's individual collaborations between the accelerators, but I would request uh, Mr. Jacob and Jennifer to answer that as well, please. I have to be honest. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I do not directly deal with this uh, area. I, I'm not the line ministry which uh, uh, deals with this. So uh, I cannot give you an answer on your question on your specific question. All right. Uh, let me respond to this question, and then we need to bring it to an end. Uh, then we'll have plenty of time uh, you know, to discuss all these issues during breaks. So right now, we stand between you and lunch. And if we don't break, then I guess he's threatening that he won't get any lunch. Thank you. Thank so, you, all the panelists, for your value. So maybe you and I can talk uh, during the break. Uh, I've got my views on information. Well, years. Thank you all the panelists for your valuable inputs and for an enriching discussion. And now we go to Srivastava to present moment first to the panelists. Shri Vinod Jacob. Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan. Jennifer Daphne. Mr. Krishna Kishore and Mr. Shiv Kumar. Sorry, sir. Now, can I request the Honorable Minister Sri Vikeshri to come on the stage, please, to join us for a group photograph with the panelists? Group photograph with the panelists. Oh, careful, careful, man. Before that, can I also request the Honorable Minister to present a memento to Dean Srivastava. Thank you and before I close this session, our special thanks from Team Deccan Dialogue to Honorable Minister General V.K. Singh for sparing his valuable time for us and for officially naming this conference on Economic Diplomacy for Development as Deccan Dialogue. Sir, with your blessings, Deccan Dialogue is born today and with support from the Ministry of External Affairs, this will be an annual edition and we request you to come and